This webinar is titled Proper Adapters to Reduce Force Measurement Error. Uh, best measurement practice is take, talking to the end user and replicating the calibration how they use equipment, which includes using the proper adapters. Of course, the end user should have adapters and provide the calibration laboratory with those same adapters they are using with the force equipment. We don't get that. It's not realistic uh, for everybody to send their adapters. I don't know why we've been in this business for years and still uh, people send the test instruments or the M&T measuring and test equipment without adapters. We ask for it. Uh, sometimes we get it, sometimes we do not. Uh, the next best thing uh, for us is to use a set of adapters that we can fall back on. And that's really what we're gonna talk about here today is those, that set of adapters you can fall back on to ensure you at least are doing things right uh, on the lab point of view, from the lab point of view. And of course, if you're the user, maybe some of these adapters are gonna make sense for you to purchase or um, supply with your load cells to improve your measurements. So some information about us, uh, if you don't know me, uh, my name is Henry Zumbrun. I am very passionate uh, about education uh, and we as a company Morehouse is passionate about making good measurements so we'll be giving you every bit of information I can during this webinar. Um, there's a lot involved in creating a presentation on measurement errors so really there's no way to, to have the ins and outs of everything of every step but I'm gonna tell you what we have found uh, to make the most impact on your measurements. So Proper adapters, this, this webinar is titled Proper Adapters to Reduce Force Measurement Error. Uh, there's my contact information. If you have questions after this that, and you get the PDF and you wanna email me, please feel free to email me. So what Morehouse does, we manufacture force calibration products. We calibrate force measuring equipment using standards with very low uncertainties. These standards allow us to lower the uncertainties of equipment sent to us for calibration. We manufacture all of the adapters shown in this webinar and we help, bottom line is we help labs make better measurements. So some questions for everyone participating here. To begin with, uh, are you confident that your equipment is calibrated properly? Is your four standard provider following the proper standards and are they using the proper adapters? Do you have a set of adapters and are you sending the adapters to your force calibration provider for calibration? This is the importance of this webinar. You know, if you have, if you're loading something in a different way than what the calibration provider is, all bets are off. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to cover this abstract. It should be about 45 minutes without the Q&A. And it's common force measurement errors and how to reduce or eliminate them with using the proper adapters. So if we go to the documentation side of this, ISO 17025, 2005, yes, the new standard 2017 is out, but in section 5.4.1, the laboratory shall use the appropriate methods and procedures for all tests and or calibrations within its scope. The importance of this is the calibration must be performed using an acceptable and agreed upon calibration method or procedure, this contract review part. The results must be provided in a report with necessary information. So what what goes wrong here is we start checking things like the method. Uh, we start looking at now in 2017, we start looking at guard banding. We look at measurement risk. We look at everything else and we can get the pr procedure. We can get ascending, descending. We can get, you know, orientation. We can get, uh, sometimes we can even get alignment blocks. But what we rarely, rarely get is uh, not using the right adapters, you know, or we rarely get, you know, what adapters are being used with it, uh, if they're sent with the equipment or not. We, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, uh, so what are we gonna do? If we don't have them, we're gonna use the next best thing and that's what we're gonna show you today. So the problem we have is if we don't get the right adapters and we don't do the right things, we can have errors that could put the force measuring device at 20 times higher than what is expected. So, and then we start start talking about competency. And this is, this is part of competency, really. Uh, using a proper adapters when calibrating force instruments, you know, uh, if we don't do it, we're gonna get, and I'm gonna show you lots of, of these examples. We're gonna get errors 10 to 20 times that of manufacturer stated accuracy. 
And then the other important thing to say is the proper alignment of the unit under test adapters and proper methods for loading th for loading threads, misalignment, different hardness of adapters, and thread loading versus shoulder loading contribute to a decrease in the repeatability of measurement results, resulting in additional measurement error. We're going to go over all of this. So first, we're going to talk about old adapters. And service life uh, of force calibration adapters depend on several factors, including design, number of load cycles, and magnitude of each load. Better material manufacturing quality control processes provide more reliable strength values for design engineers than 20 years ago. It is recommended that old adapters be inspected and replaced if they have been used for more than 20 years or 100,000 load cycles, which is approximately, depending on how you're how you're doing your calibrations, approximately 10,000 calibrations. Now, if you look at the bottom right, uh, there's a this is a, the top of a grade eight bolt that failed, and it failed after about 350,000 load cycles. The problem we have is it really shouldn't have failed, but it was one of those adapters that was 20 years old. And its counterpart uh, was about to fail probably about two weeks ago, and, and we noticed it. So looking at things, um, we've improved our process on, on the adapters that we make, but it, it, it is an example of something that you think is safe. Uh, it's 350,000 load cycles, and it still failed. So... Uh, Again, this one was more than 20 years old, so it's this is why this uh, slide is here that old adapters can can have issues, and there's there's an example of it. Uh, newer adapters are designed for a life cycle of at least half a million load cycles or 50,000 calibrations, and failure at close to one million load cycles. Um, and now that we have explained some of the safety recommendations, let's start to discuss some examples uh, where the proper adapters are going to yield better results. So I wanted to get wanted to get a little bit of information on that. The wrong tension adapters. If any of these look like the tension adapters in your calibration lab, there is a problem. I, I look, we get the webinar list of people that 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 sign up for this. I hope this does not look like any of the adapters in your labs. But even the one here to the left, even a straight threaded rod can introduce misalignment issues as they can distort the line of force in non Morehouse machines. Um, they can distort the line of force in Morehouse machines as well um, if if they're not as straight as they see that they should be. But that's a, that's a whole other story on, on machines, and we might have a webinar coming up on that. Any machine misalignment of 0.01 degrees can affect the reproducibility of some load cells. Even our spherical adapters can only overcome about 0.1 degree of misalignment. So, again, uh, the importance of adapters, you know, keeping the line of force pure, free from eccentric loads, is key to calibration of load cells. ASTM E74, which is a standard for force calibration does not address the various adapter types, but ISO 376, which is a European standard for force calibration, uh, does. What ISO 376 says is it says in the Annex A4.1, load fitting should be designed in such a way that the line of force application is not distorted. As a rule, tensile force transducers should be fitted with two ball nuts, two ball cups, and if necessary, with two intermediate rings, while compressive force transducers should be fitted with one or two compression pads. So here's some of our quick change adapters here. Um, to the left, we have threaded adapters, then we have cu coupling nuts. These are all designed to that specification in, in ISO, and the radiuses on um, the adapters in the center are, are compliant with the ISO 376 Annex recommendations. So let's look at, let's look at various adapters. Uh, let's, let's start with tension links, improper versus proper pin diameter. You know, Loaded with the proper pin diameter instrument here, the instrument reads 50,000 pounds. Loaded without the proper pin diameter, the instrument reads 49,140. You know, this is interesting because this device, the specification of this device is 0.1% of, of full scale, whereas we vary the pin diameter and we have a difference of 860 pounds or a 1.72% error at a at 50,000 from not using the proper size load pins. Uh, very much an out of tolerance versus intolerance condition. So I must say, uh, I tried to cover the names, but if you saw it go by quickly, um, this, this particular manufacturer, all of these tension links have issues. De 
does not, you know, doesn't matter who the manufacturer is. What goes on with these tension links is essentially where I'm drawing the yellow highlight here. This is the gauging section. So the, the, the links are gauged here. So any, any variation in that pin size is going to produce a different amount of stress and is going to pull and elongate the tension link. Uh, and the strain gauges are going to see a different amount of strain uh, depending on the actual pin size. So if we go to the manufacturer, um, and manufacturers emit things, uh, the manufacturer says using the correct correctly sized pins is critical. If the links are damaged, highly used, or worn, uh, the recommendation is to degree, decrease the time between calibrations. The same size and style of shackle and pin used during operation should be used for calibration, and maintaining pin orientation is best practice. That means if you label, if you have four shackles, labeling a top and a bottom is really good practice because they wear different. And the shackles, if you're using this type of lifting equipment, they have different wear patterns. So if we look at what we have to help facilitate the calibration of the tension links, we have uh, the quick change tension adapter system with various clevises uh, and various pin sizes. And what's really interesting here is when you look at the manufacturer's websites, you can see all the different dimensions, the hole sizes, and what's recommended for pins. And here's an example. And in this example, um, the Dillon EDX 20 ton, the recommendation is a two inch pin, where the 25 ton is a 1.97 inch pin. Larger instrument takes a smaller pin, does not seem intuitive, but it's there. You can see that, uh, you can look here and you can look at the across here where I'm highlighting. There's a two inch pin. And if you look over here, here's a 1.97 inch pin. So it's what it is. It's the recommendation. Our design engineer went through almost every manufacturer's um, specification sheets and he went through and he designed this pin set, which is a clevis with multiple size pins and bearings. And if when you if you get the PDF and you click on the link to it, you can go to the website and you can see all the different manufacturers um, and all the different recommendations and the different adapter to use. So what's what's nice about it is if you have a if you have a known pin size and you need a 1.97 inch pin. It the the marketing document the brochure will tell you exactly what adapter has a 1.97 inch pin. On top of that, it will tell you all the other instruments that call for the 1.97 inch pin. So if you're running these in your lab, you can be sure that you are using the pin size per the manufacturer's recommendation. So then we have a another. This one's an interesting. This is air associated with using a non-flat base on a multi-column cell. This is an actual test, and this was a Revere multi-column load cell. Very good load cell. If you look at this base at the bottom here, it's a non-ground base originally installed on a load cell. What we're looking at is maximum error, whether you want to see it in engineering units or if you want to see it in uh, percentage. But if we look at this, this is rotational error, maximum error with a non-flat base here. At capacity, it was 342 pounds. This is rotating 0, 120, and 240 degree rotations in the machine. And that produced a 0.114% deviation um, between between the results. And then when we looked at when we when we looked at this and we did away with this base here and we stoned this other surface and made it flat, that error dropped from 0.114 to 0 0.023. So loading on a flat base uh, will definitely improve the results, especially if you're testing for reproducibility conditions such as ISO 376 or ES, ASTM E74 calibrations. So a flat bottom plate may be needed to improve performance. It is often not recommended uh, practice to load against the machine's surface as it could be uneven or the base of the load cell could deform the machine surface. Pictured left is a Morehouse 600K or 660K rod end style load cell with spherical threaded adapter, top compression pad, and load cell base plate. So generally, load cell bases have holes in them, and if you're going to put them on a machine and you're going to load to a high capacity, even 60K, you're probably going to start to deform the material underneath it. 
Then we get to different hardness of top adapters. Um, different hardness of top ad adapters on column load cells can produce errors as high as 0.1 or 0.3%. Prior to this experiment, I thought it was around 0.15, 0.2%. This was interesting. There's a picture of a, a column load cell on the right, and we loaded it with those different adapters, just the different top plates there. And there you see a 4340 top block, you see two, two runs and what the deflections were, and then you see the hardened block and what the deflections were. What's interesting here is the difference, negative 0.307%, um, negative 0.2%. 279 and negative 0.263. So the difference between a 4340 top block and a hardened top block uh, producing errors uh, as high as 0.307% on this particular load cell. There are two points to make about this. Material with different hardness experience different amounts of lateral deflection under the same amount of load. This causes different amounts of stress between the block and load cell. Flatness and smoothness of the block is important in that it will change the contact position on the load cell. The assumption is the load cell has a radius, maybe you know R17, and it's designed to be loaded exactly at the center of the spherical section. But an unbalanced or non-flat block can shift the contact point off center. As the stress analysis on the left shows, a small amount of shift will change the stress distribution. The key to this is to use the same adapters in use as used in calibration. The adapter should be manufactured not to produce off-axis forces. So we continue to look at this. Uh, what causes what causes material deformation? Material with lower yield strength than what is being applied will deform until the maximum compressive strength is below the material yield point. You can see that at the top here. This is just an example at the top that I'm highlighting um, where we've, we've deformed the material. And a, a steep radius concentrates the force over a smaller area and may cause material to permanently deform. That could deform on the top of the load cell. But, but if, you, if you use an integral top adapter or you use a hardened, um, a hardened top block here, it does not matter. Your calibration will repeat. Um, and that's why we recommend having a Morehouse compression top lock made it to any load cell. Uh, if it deforms with the load cell and you continue to use it, you send it in for Cal, year after year it will repeat. So some compression adapters. Uh, pictured above is our 600K concrete set. Um, this is composed of a 5K load cell, a 60K load cell, and a 600K mini load cell. The mini load cell weighs about 25 pounds, and with the top and bottom adapter weighs less than 40 pounds total for, for this, this over here. Uh, this was made in an effort uh, to lower the actual physical weight of technicians carrying cells around to calibrate machines, specifically the 600K, 400K uh, concrete machines that are out there that they can put this in, they can check it in uh, their baggage. It's You can get this in a case at under 50 pounds so you can check it with you on a plane. That's why this, this smaller load cell was made and its performance is better than 0.02% of full scale. So it'll have a ASTM verified range of forces of better than 8%. Uh, so. ISO 376 compression adapters. Uh, compressive force transducers should be fitted with one or two compression pads. Here's an example. The example on the bottom is the ISO 370 from the actual ISO 376 2011 standard, and then the example on the right are adapters is our print of what we've what we've made. And there's more. There's that that adapter on a load cell. Here's that adapter modeled on a load cell. Now, ISO also recommends bottom adapters if the load cell is a certain size. On the 100K load cell here, this is a 100K shear web load cell, that if you want to be compliant with ISO 376, that also needs a bottom adapter. Um, these are newer adapters for us, not the top, but the bottom ones. So if anybody has any interest in those, uh, you can contact sales at MH Force for more information on ISO adapters. Here's misalignment of an S-beam. So you have an S-beam, send it in for calibration. We perform the calibration. We have everything aligned. And then a technician goes in the field or, or a Cal technician um, goes and the picture on the right and they just slightly misalign it. It's maybe a 16th, maybe an eighth of an inch out of alignment. I had to put this line in here to show. It's really, really not that far out of alignment. But what I want, 
what's important here is the output aligned in the machine is one negative 1.96732 millivolts versus slightly misaligned, which is negative 1.98211 millivolts. If we look at that, uh, specifically we look at that misalignment demonstrating a 0.752% error. Expanded uncertainty when we calibrated this, this load cell, uh, ASTM lower limit factor was 9.95 uh, LBF and that included repeatability resolution and everything else. But if we look at that technician bias or that slight misalignment, um, the error, the expanded uncertainty from that with a 0.752% error would jump from 10 pounds to roughly, you know, 85 pounds. So quite a considerable amount of error. If we look at, if we continue to look at this throughout the whole range of forces, uh, this was an ASTM cal where we started at 2%, you can see that that 0.75% misalignment error, uh, you can see at each force point and what it does. And at the end, it's, you know, 86.06. Um, Overall uncertainty, uh, you know, increases 8.6 times with just the slightest bit of misalignment on an S-beam load cell. Then you look at a shear web load cell, and this just shows that not all load cells are made the same way. This load cell is, you can see, is way, the misalignment here is, it, this is just negligent. Negligent misalignment um, should not be misaligned this poorly. Visually, you can see it's off axis. On a shear web load cell, the error, is around 22 parts per million, or um, overall uncertainty would on a shear web cell would go from about 0.41 to 0.527 with slight misalignment. Either way, there's errors. Uh, both are are you know there are errors both ways. It's just the fact that the S beam is uh, dramatic, whereas the shear web is less dramatic. But in either case, the recommendation here is going to be used to use an alignment plug. You know, uh, machinists can machine holes and we can make adapters that are so much better than anyone's human eye uh, or with rulers and everything else, scales, calipers, whatever you're using. If you have that machine center hole and an alignment plug, you will be, you can force the alignment um, to be on that, the right plane. So alignment plug there, uh, this is the second one is the alignment hole in our machine platen. If you have one of our cow machines, dead weight machines, the recommendation is to put the alignment plug in. And then we look on the compression side, uh, using a ball adapter pictured top right. If the machine has a ball adapter and it often yields the best results. If the ball adapter does not exist, a spherical alignment adapter pictured top left will help align the force. Uh, from the previous slide, some load cells are just more sensitive to alignment and thread engagement issues making adapters even more critical. Uh, this would be the, probably going to be the recommendation there for that S-beam cell is to have, have a top adapter with a radius. On the Morehouse cell or some of the other shear web cells, if you can use it and you have a ball adapter in your machine, ball adapters, uh, for the most part, uh, yield much, much better results when, when the device is rotated. Loading through different thread depths, uh, here's a, this is a Sensatec model RFG, nothing wrong with the load cell, uh, lots of load cells have different issues. This one just is an adapter issue and that's why we're showing it. So we did two different tests with two different adapters, the adapters pictured here, bottom, you know, bottom right. Um, one had one and a half inches of engagement, the other one had a half inch of engagement. The difference was about 59.2 pounds on a 10,000 pound load cell, just by using these two adapters. What one's right? I don't know. I would opt for uh, one of those spherical adapters, but this error on this particular measurement was over half percent on a device expected to be better than 0.025%, 20 times expected. And then you have to ask, do you have any of these devices where people in your organization are just grabbing whatever, using whatever thread depth and calibrating it, compression tension? Because the, the error is gonna be the same uh, if you're doing tension, it's gonna be the exact same as uh, compression, the uh, one and a half, hopefully not half inch engagement and tension, but that's another story, that's safety. Um, but the point is, uh, or the solution is, uh, pick a top adapter and always use and have the force measuring device calibrated with that top adapter. In this example, Morehouse spherical load button would be an excellent top adapter for this load cell. 
that's the bottom line. If you if you don't have one, get a, get the right adapters, calibrate them with the right adapters. You will be able to reproduce the results of the calibration lab. If they're sent to us for calibration, we will use your adapters, calibrate them with them, put them in the dead weight machines, and you can get them back. And the expected performance should be that of what we achieved at the during calibration. And we start looking at shear web load cells. And I say we see a lot of these come in where the devices look like this on the left. A great shear web load cell. I just showed that picture where they're not as sensitive to off-axis loading and everything else. But you remove that integral threaded adapter and the errors get quite large quite quickly. Here's an example with three different adapters screwed into the load cell, one, two, and three. And if you look at the max error between adapters, man, we're already at, at capacity, we're at 0.58%, and at 600 pounds, we're at 1.7% error. So very, very large errors from not, you know, using, from using various adapter types. Uh, solution again, the best solution is this right here. I highly recommend this. Just lock a threaded adapter into the cell. They're preloaded. If they're done right in the lab, they're preloaded, they're locked in. You will be able to reproduce the results all day long and you will not have to worry about that additional error source from the thread depth. Now, I know some people have to use these in type you know where they don't have that much overall height if that is the case the second the second pick would use would be to recommend using a spherical top adapter and always have the device calibrated with that top adapter and in this example a morehouse spherical load button would be an excellent adapter for this load cell then we deal with loading through the bottom threads in compression here on the left is how we load most load cells unless otherwise noted. And here on the right is how most of our competitors load the load cells unless otherwise noted because they can fix, they can do compression and tension in the same setup. So therefore they're gonna load through top and bottom threads. Our dead weight machines, we do compression in one setup and tension in another. It's not really a big deal. It's just you have to know what you're getting or what you what your expectations are. So the difference here at 25,000 pounds is three pounds. Is that a huge error? I don't know. It depends on your application. It depends on how critical your application is. But you can do this test uh, all day long in a dead weight frame, and pretty much every time you're going to get about a 0.01%, a 0.012, somewhere in that neighborhood, that error. Uh, from loading against the base versus loading through the threads. All you need to do is instruct or tell the calibration, the people that are performing the calibration, how you load it and how you want it loaded. If you are running a calibration lab and your customers say, load it through the bottom threads, uh, Morehouse threaded adapters uh, that are used for tension can also be used in this situation for compression, can be used for loading through the threads in compression and or tension if needed. That's part of that quick change tension member kit. These are you know various thread sizes, so you use the same quick change tension member adapters, and then you can just swap out um, different thread size. I we went through lean. Uh, it's a cycle, reduced cycle time. It does these do a lot, but they can also be used for. The point is, they can also be used for compression loading through the bottom threads if needed. We get to button load cell calibration. Anybody that's doing this type of calibration knows the issues already. If you're not doing it, uh, button load cells are notoriously horrible to calibrate. They just do not repeat any misalignment, any off access just produces very, very large errors. So here we did a test. This is part of a blog. If, if people are reading the blog, there's a blog on this um, where we did a test. We did traditional you know, load something right here, load it flat, and then use a piece of, you know, ground steel on the top, uh, flat hardened block, um, semi-hardened block on the top, and then record the data. We rotated it, manually aligned it, rotated it. You can see here, zero degree read this, 120 read this, 240 read this, average was this, standard deviation was this, the maximum deviation was 21 pounds out of uh, 2000, which is 1.045% uh, error. So then we used these adapters on the right that we made, uh, that we made for calibration of button load cells. And you can see the standard deviation 
went from 10 to two max deviation still four pounds uh, on a 2000 pound load cell but the percent error decreased so we you know we improved the measurement result by about 525 percent it's still not fantastic but for a button load cell, it's probably the best you're going to get. And when I say it's still not fantastic, we see these come in where somebody says, hey, I want the specification to be 0.05% of full scale. You know, right here I'm showing you an error of 0.2, and this is this is about the best you can get. So it's, you know, know, know what the instrument's actually capable of, and then use the right adapters to achieve uh, the level, the best level of calibration that you possibly can. So there's pictures of button and washer load cell adapters, which improve alignment and yield better calibration results. To the left is the button load cells model. To the right is the one is the washer load cell. Very similar uh, in the problems uh, for the calibration laboratory. Yeah, and if you click down here, um, I'm hovering over them. There's if you get the PDF, there's there's web links to those adapters, and then the adapter sheets say all the models and capacities and and everything that they do. So then we move on. Aircraft and truck scale adapters. Lots of people that I know, a lot of people that calibrate truck and aircraft scales, and they're typically used to weigh trucks and airplanes with the tires sitting on several scales. You know, the plane plane pulls up, the truck pulls up. You know, you sit on four scales, sit on three scales. Um, any adapter used, my the important part of this is any adapter used during calibration should be composed of the same type of rubber and should have the same footprint as the tire to ensure accurate results. I know lots of people stack weights onto these scales, but that does not simulate a truck tire or an airplane tire. If you, and if you think about it, you know, they're rolling these adapters up. Manufacturer of these scales is saying it needs to be flat, but yet they're weighing on concrete uh, oftentimes with the aircraft scales. And then they have tires that may not be inflated properly. They have just various things. The best we can do is to have those adapters that replicate that footprint or that those adapters that the manufacturer says are to be used to calibrate the scale, such as the case to the to the left here. This is this is the recommended adapter for an intercomp um, 60k scale. And then on the on the right here is a picture of uh, our 804 60k aircraft scale press with the various with that adapter uh, set up in in the machine. So. Adapters for handheld force gauges. Uh, there's, you know, you have handheld force gauges. This is more of a safety issue. People stack weights. Uh, the picture of our PCM here, our portable calibrating machine, our 2K portab portable calibrating machine with a bunch of different L brackets. Uh, these force gauges were made with different centering distance, diff distances and different hole patterns. So if you look at these, um, if you look at these adapters, we've made kits that try to get all the different centering distance and all the different hole patterns uh, they are available uh, they these kits simplify setup and reduce the errors with stacking weights and you, you know the pcm uh, right there's the pcm it can be used to calibrate almost anything load cells button cells everything else it's a new product it's a 2000 pound uh, force transfer machine load cell standard and you can see to the picture on the left there's a handheld force gauge in there and the picture to the right there's a load cell to load cell there it's we can hold forces on this machine to about 0.005 percent but the importance is that those handheld force gauges if people are manually lifting weights on and off uh you can reduce that you can eliminate the safety concerns the ergonomic issues with the right uh adapter kit for for the handheld force gauges then we get into the large tension adapters. Um, we manufacture, we'll manufacture almost anything. Many high capacity load cells, 200K and above, are designed with custom threads or fixtures. Safety and quality control becomes even more important at large capacities where mishaps can be life threatening. You know, when something lets go at, you know, 500 pounds, it's not nearly as dangerous as something that lets go at uh, 2.25 million or 2.5 million pounds. Uh, especially depending on what the adapter is made of and how it lets go. If it is if it is hardened and brittle, it's going to snap pretty quickly versus a softer material with pins. And pins, you can put the wrong pin in sometimes and bend the pin, uh, and then you've just messed up the adapter and not the instrument. So it's, 
different things to consider, but we have designed large force adapters up to 2.5 million pounds. They are lots of material um, and uh, lots of triple checking, quadruple checking calculations, uh, especially for these high capacities. But if interested, let us know. Communication with the customer. So we're looking at proper adapters. And then in conclusion, if you're running a lab or you, you, know, you have something to send in for calibration, communication with the customer is key to address these issues. And unfortunately, it doesn't always happen. Uh, we get examples where you have third party suppliers that don't want to tell you who their customer is and won't put you in, in touch with the technician. If that sounds familiar, then what are you going to do? And then you have purchasing departments that, again, sent the order. They don't, don't really know who the end user is, or sometimes they won't put you through to the end user. And then the other thing is you have management that says, hey, just calibrate it. We don't, you know, ask you ask us about proper adapters, difference. Hey, we don't care. Just calibrate it. And then you have large companies where it's difficult to reach the technician using the device. We get through most of these. Um, Third-party suppliers can be a bit tricky, and management who, do not, who does not care is, of course, very tricky. But if we don't get through to them, uh, the ideal solution it would be to calibrate the device uh, with the appropriate adapters that can be referenced. So, you know, the adapter sets, the pin sizes, the threaded adapters, all that stuff that you have. You can say, oh, yeah, it's a 5818. I use those adapters there. They're marked. And then if there's any issue or any questions, you know exactly what you did. Again, the ideal solution in, in all cases is to calibrate the device with the customer's adapters. If they send in a load set without adapters, then you mark on the cert what you did. So it's hopefully the people that are viewing this will, if you're not already thinking about adapters, you'll start thinking about sending them in for calibration or you'll start thinking about using the right adapters uh, so you can replicate or at least can go back on and say, yes, I used a 1.97 inch pin on that tension link. Or yes, I used a two inch pin on that 20 ton tension link, you know. Additional measurement errors, uh, these are the ones that we covered briefly today. Proper pin size with tension links, we covered a little bit on misalignment. Thread depth on column load cells, um, thread depth on shear web cells, loading through the bottom threads and compression, calibration of button load cells, washer load cells, hardness of top plates, blocks, thread depth errors, all of these, all of these right here, proper adapters will eliminate the majority of these errors. Now, in our two-day class, we talk a lot more in depth about, uh, instead of just this overview, we talk a lot more in depth about, uh, you know, errors, as well as talk about other things, such as cable stiffness, using mass weights instead of force, cable length, not following published standards, different excitation voltages, errors from used batteries. Yes, that's, if you, we have a demonstration that shows quite a large error from using, you know, used batteries versus fully charged. Some of the other devices, if you don't have a full charge, they don't work right. Uh, these are the, some of the tension, uh, tension, tension type of devices, wireless ones. Molecule excitement decline, ascending versus descending curves, timing, appropriate extra, not switching standards, difference in technicians, dual range calibrations, having a TUR that is lower than one to one, and what that means. So anybody interested in training, there's the link right there to our training page. You can get information. Our next class is going to be about three and a half days. So conclusion on adapters, uh, using the right calibration provider who has measurement process and certainly capable of meeting your needs and follows published standards, making sure the calibration replicates how the instrument is being used by using the right adapters to ensure results are repeatable, and of course, having competent technicians. Some common issues with most force calibration laboratories, uh, CMC values are unrealistic. You know, we report realistic CMCs and wrote a guidance document on how to do four CMCs. If anybody's interested in this document, I can share the, the rough draft that's currently at A to LA. There may be some changes. There's a lack of understanding the standards. We help draft several standards and guidance documents, not proper properly evaluate measurement risk or probability of false accept. We report PFA. The lab does not replicate how the instruments are used by using the right adapters. We ask these questions and always seek to replicate use when possible. Sometimes it's not possible. 
So if you look at us for calibration versus a typical lab, there's an example of TURs. Uh, in this example, we have a CMC of 002% of applied, which equates on this device to a TUR of 22 to 1 or 1 to 1. What does that mean? If you look at that graphically, that means we have lots of room um, on either side. Um, the larger the TUR, the lower the risk, and the more room you have to be in tolerance on either side of the acceptance limit. So again, um, you know, 100% satisfaction is what we strive for. We don't always get it, uh, but we strive for 100%, you know, overall customer satisfaction. And we strive to be regarded as the best independent force and torque calibration resource in the world by providing realistic solutions and continually develop new products to meet customer needs. We also like to defy the averages and meet 100% on quality delivery and overall customer satisfaction. So, as part of this, all these adapter kits, if you're interested in any of them, are now available as 20% off on our Better Results promotion. There's the full tension kit, the adapters with the tension members with the threaded adapters, and then there's the clevis example of a clevis kit with all clevis kit here with all the different pin sizes. And then if you're doing the handheld or smaller stuff, handheld force gauges, there's uh, the handheld L bracket kit with all the different centering plates and adapters for the PCM. So some upcoming information, and then I'm gonna turn it over for Q&A. Upcoming webinars and training. Um, the new ASTM 18 has been released. It was released last Thursday. Our next webinar will cover the changes from ASTM 13A standard, as well as discuss all the requirements of the new standard. And that will be June 5th at 11 a.m. If you're interested in ASTM, that webinar uh, and all the new standards. We do have a blog that details the majority, uh, the major differences between E7413 and 18. You can go over to our blog. And then we have our next training, which will be three and a half days at our facility. The training is going to be October 2nd through the 5th. We're going to start on a Tuesday with uh, statistical process controls, do two days with force you know, force measurement error. And then on the third day, it's just going to be a half day. That's going to be, you know, if you're interested in ISO 17025, the 2017, the new version, it's going to be what's new in that standard and how to, how do you comply with that? It's a nice half day course. that's uh, taught by Dilip Shaw on that one. And I'm going to open this up for questions. I'm going to, so give me a second and thank you everybody for staying with us.